welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a, plan, a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top, with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And I think most of us probably remember what happens next. The Lord, concerned that nothing will be impossible for humanity, confuses the language among the people and scatters them all. In seeking to make a name for themselves, human beings wind up realizing their deepest fear. Ironic, isn't it? Of course, this isn't the first time in the Bible that humans try to glorify themselves to their own demise. Earlier in the book of Genesis, prompted by a fast-talking serpent, Adam and Eve partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, going against God's express forbidding. And why do they eat because the crafty serpent tells them they will be like gods. And who doesn't want to be that? Whenever we seek to glorify ourselves, to make ourselves out to be like God, well, we fail to fulfill God's true vision for our lives. And even worse, we may wind up spoiling the world for other people. We may not intend this, but in seeking our own greatness, we might wind up serving as stumbling blocks to other people's faith. And Jesus teaches us that this is to our own demise. Last month, we read a number of stories about how God provides for all living things and how God sustains us, especially in the hardest times, and how God calls us as disciples of Jesus Christ to help meet the spiritual and physical needs of those who are hungry, naked, sick, imprisoned, impoverished, and dying. That is our spiritual work. So when we, disciples, indulge in vain glory and selfishness, when we fail to share God's love and providence with our neighbors, especially those in need, well, we run afoul of God's intent for life on earth. But the good news is, though we may stray, Throughout the Bible, God continually seeks to restore that original vision. Return to a loving, faithful relationship with his people. We can read this from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Little surprise then that what follows the Tower of Babel story is a story about God calling one man to bless all the families of the earth, confused and displaced as they might be. It's a story about God's prevenient grace working through a single, adventurous, faithful soul. All right, let's read this story. Let's open our Bibles, the ones we brought, the ones in our pews, the apps on our phones, and turn to Genesis chapter 12, first verse. 
as we turn to it, let's understand that God calls this man, whose name means exalted father, to leave his home and travel to a land where God will make a great nation of him and his offspring. It seems an appropriate story for the day that we celebrate the birth of our nation and thank our forefathers. It's the story of Abram, and it's Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife, Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At the time, at the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on in stages toward the Negev. The word of God for the people of God and the people of God say, Thanks be to God. To your offspring, I will give this land. Sometimes it seems as though a good number of faithful people focus on this sentence, this sentence alone, without remembering the divine vision stated earlier. I will make, you, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The Hebrew word for families here, I mean, this, the, the meaning of this goes even deeper, okay? The meaning of the Hebrew word for families, okay, the word is mishpacha, which can also mean tribe, clan, people, and nation, but it can even mean species. Species. So imagine this now. Every species on earth, every living thing, will be blessed through Abram and his descendants. That's a really grand vision. And I hope that at some point we have all experienced something like this. When we sincerely put our faith and our trust in God, and when we follow God's guidance, we will be blessed beyond our wildest imaginings. I hope we've all kind of experienced or felt this in some way. But as we see in our story, God's economy of blessing is not a zero-sum game. Our gain of blessings is not supposed to be anybody else's loss. Our blessings should not foist curses upon others. God blesses us so that all the families of the world, indeed all life on earth, shall be blessed. Why does it feel then that when we consider and take stock of our blessings in life, we appear to think mainly of ourselves or those like us. And when we celebrate the birth of our nation, why does it so often seem that we use the word ours in an exclusive or a self-centered way? As if to say, 
This is ours. Not ours. When Abram leaves his home in Ur, the land that we now know as southern Iraq, he and his family migrate to lands already populated. Abram and his family journey some 690 miles, largely, most likely on foot. And everyone they come across all have well-established kingdoms and cultures and languages and religious beliefs and customs. And centuries later, even after God gives the descendants of Abram the lands we now know as Israel and Judah, well, the Israelites still have to live alongside the neighbors who have lived in these lands for centuries before Abram ever came along. All this is to say that how we live alongside our neighbors will set the tone of the relationship for us in our time and for generations to come. So why would we not bless our neighbors? That is to say, to pray for their divine well-being as well as our own. Why would we not Bless them with providence if they need. Why would we not cry out for justice on their behalf if they need, just as we do for ourselves? God is the creator and owner of everything we see, feel, smell, touch, and taste. Everything that we can measure belongs to God and God alone. We are merely stewards of all this in the short time we have on this earth. When we hoard God's providence to ourselves, be it wealth, or job, or needed resources, political or social power, and when we use what power we have to accrue yet more power to ourselves, not only do we stray far from God's original intent, but we guarantee lifetimes of needless conflict and strife for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. The story in Genesis is played out, and all the way through the Old Testament plays itself out this way over and over and over again. Our divine work is to bless. To bless and not to curse. Abram's call actually reminds me, Abram's call to bless the families of all the earth, that is, reminds me a bit of our Declaration of Independence. In the second paragraph it reads, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, we all remember that at the time of this writing, slavery in the colonies was still widely practiced. So much so, in fact, that our original constitution counted slaves as three-fifths of a human being. And in those days, women of every color had few routes to owning property for themselves, nor did they have the right to vote. In fact, women in the United States did not win the right to vote until 1919, some 143 years after the colonies began their struggle for independence. And here's something I actually learned from social media. There's so little we can learn from it, but this is something I learned. Credit card companies would not issue credit cards to women until sometime in the 1970s. Almost 200 years of American history went by before banks would issue credit cards to women. They had to rely on their husband's credit cards, and what unmarried women did 
I have no idea. I think you all do, though. Somehow I have a feeling you all do. I can't imagine it. I said, Gen Xer, I just can't imagine it. But even though in the beginning and for a very long time thereafter, even though the grand vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness blessed only a rather narrow segment of our entire population, our inclination as a people has always been to drive towards that grander vision, to include even more people within it to ensure that as many people as possible are blessed by the vision articulated by the founders of our great nation. And so, friends, as we celebrate the birth of our country, as we remember the beginnings of of us as a people, let's hold fast to our founders' original intent. And as a people of Christ, let's hold fast to God's vision of our becoming a blessing to every family on earth. Let's imagine that vision expanding across the political and economic and social and cultural and ethnic divides that currently separate us. Perhaps we can think about it this way. When God calls Abram, God promises to bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. God promises to do these things. Vengeance is mine, so saith the Lord, right? In other words, Abram need not waste his time on those who curse and criticize him. Abram is free to focus on being a blessing. And so are we. Perhaps if we focused on viewing other people not as opponents or as threats to our way of life, but as fellow human beings, as fellow countrymen, as as neighbors, and maybe if we brought ourselves to define the word ours not in in an exclusive sense or a selfish way, but in a broader way that includes other people, even those who are somehow distanced from us, And maybe if we accepted God's call on Abram to serve as a blessing for all the families of the earth as our own calling, well, maybe we would find ways to resolve our conflicts in more peaceable ways. And maybe we could all find ways to thrive together, to lift one another up and build up this great nation. I love the final words in our Declaration of Independence. They're probably some of the most powerful words I've ever read. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What would our country look like if we all pledged ourselves to one another? In our time and in our place, in our nation's history, that's our call. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. And God, on this special day, we give you thanks to our great nation, for our great nation. God, we pray that your spirit of healing will hover over all this country and remind us that even as we are many, You make us one. And God, we pray for all of our leaders, all of them, whatever side of the aisle they may pitch their tent upon. God, we pray for them all 
that you will grant them all a wisdom, a spirit of wisdom and compassion and mercy and justice. That they may regard us all as our as representatives for us. And so, God, we just we pray that your Holy Spirit will bless this nation from this time until all time. And God, we thank you for your son Jesus who came into this world and taught us how to love one another, to pray for one another's healing, to feed us in our hunger, to invite us, though others may reject us, to heal us in our sickness, to raise us from the dead, and to forgive us when we transgress. And God, he gave himself for us that we might be forgiven of our sin not just for today, but for all time. And you raised him up out of the tomb as a sign of your everlasting forgiveness, steadfast love, and precious mercy. And so now, in our gratitude for him and for everything, every blessing that we have in life, we now offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.